Howdy, everyone. My name is Nicholas Cavazos. Here on The Meaning of Catholic, Jesus is King. Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to The Meaning of Catholic, to the Sunday sermons of St. Alphonsus Liguori. Hopefully, by the time that you're watching this, right, it should be in the beginning and or middle of the second week of Advent. And so I'm hoping that you're having a holy and blessed time this season of Advent. Um, in this season of really coming and waiting for the Lord and meditating on the mysteries of the incarnation, of the birth of our Lord, etc. I want us to recognize that um, as our Lord was born into this world, so we through the sacrament of baptism, through that process of regeneration, are born anew to spiritual life. But that life of religion, that life of glory that is the Christian life, that is the Catholic life, is not a life that is one of pure peace and of earthly physical bliss. It is not one of pure emotional tranquility. Rather, it is a life more times than not wrought with hardship, with tribulation, with fright, with um, war, if you will, of spirit and flesh fighting against one another. So today what we're going to be discussing in this sermon by St. Alphonsus Liguori is going to be that subject of tribulation, right? That subject that oftentimes uh, Christians don't like to hear a whole lot being talked about, but is very pertinent for our own day and age. The last thing I'll say before we move into this sermon uh, about this idea of tribulation is that we must recognize, especially in the era in which we are living in, right? We cannot fall into this um, lackadaisical or this over-naive attitude of saying that persecution against Catholics only existed either A, right, in some faraway time period like the early centuries of the church, or B, right, it won't happen in my lifetime, but if it does happen, it's going to be in these small ways, right, or maybe in a country that is very distant from me, right, someplace out of the United States of America, per se, or maybe outside of Europe or Australia, or just kind of the Western, if you will, English-speaking countries. That being the case, we need to recognize that according to St. Paul, he says, right, that all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, right? Our Lord in the Beatitudes says, as one of the great Beatitudes, blessed are those who are persecuted, right? Because there's the kingdom of God, right? The persecuted are those who are going to be seeking after the Lord, living according to his precepts, and therefore incurring the wrath, the ire, the anger of the world. We live in a society, unfortunately, now where many Catholics are very lax in the way in which they are living, very lax in their morals, very lax in their evangelistic zeal, in fighting for the souls of their fellow man, very lax in wanting to push back in the context of secular culture, push back the hordes of darkness by the power of God's grace. Rather, we live in a time period in which many Catholics would like to live under a rock, would like to find a barn out in the middle of nowhere and never come out, right? Would like to hide away and to conceal themselves when in fact Christ, right, according to the sacred scriptures, gives us the power to fight against the devil, but also gives us the power to fight against the darkness, that whether that be the forces of this world or whether that be the spiritual forces that are in high places, as the book of Ephesians says, right? Christ gives us the power of God to fight against these things. That all being the case, we need to recognize that when we incur tribulation, it is a good sign, right? with some parameters, which we'll get into into this video. All right, so again, without any further ado, let us go ahead and dive into this second sermon of St. Alphonsus Liguori on tribulations, and then after we're done, I'll be able to come back with you guys and talk a little bit about my thoughts about this sermon. It's been made by the church, the moral doctor, and so really in all areas of moral theology, it is very much so a prudent measure to go ahead and to consult the works of St. Alphonsus Liguori. 
we're going to be doing on every Sunday here on the Meeting of Catholic, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, we're going to be doing a Sunday sermon series over his works, beginning with today, the first Sunday of Advent. But before we go ahead and dive in, let me give you a little bit of the order of how this is this episode is going to play out, and then we'll dive into specifically the meat of said subject. So first and foremost, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be launching into uh, the readings for this particular Sunday, along with the commentary that is found inside of the St. Andrew's Daily Missal. And the reason we're doing this is one, other than the fact that it's just really good commentary, um, we want to start to recognize uh, that the liturgical year is not uh, a random assortment of feast days and readings, but rather that the liturgical year is telling us a story. Right. Ultimately, it's the story of the life of Christ and, our, and also, in a certain sense, the life of the believer who has been sanctified by the Holy Ghost right, with sanctifying grace through the sacraments of baptism, penance, etc. And so we're going to be diving into specifically the readings for the Sunday, the commentary that you're going to find in the St. Andrew's Missal. And then we're going to be diving into specifically the sermon given by St. Alphonsus Liguori. And then after that, I'm going to give you my own personal um commentary, if you will, my own personal thoughts of things that I think maybe are relevant, um, that we can really draw from the text of St. Alphonsus. Um, that being the case, again, right, what you can do is you can see inside of the video um, timestamps, right? If you're just wanting to hear the sermon by St. Alphonsus Liguori, you can go ahead and just jump to that. If you're just wanting to hear me rant, you're missing out, right? But you're, uh, But you can go ahead and skip uh, to where I'm talking, or if you don't want to hear me talk, that's cool too, right? Um, and so let's go ahead and dive in now into this Sunday sermon, and we'll begin. The Sunday Sermons of St. Alphonsus de Liguori, according to the liturgical calendar of the traditional Roman Missal of 1954, with commentary for the propers of the Mass given by Dom Gaspar Lefebvre, Order of St. Benedict. Narrated by Nicholas Cavazos, also known as the traditional Thomist, Third Order of St. Dominic. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas for light and guidance. O ineffable creator, who, out of the abundance of thy wisdom, has constituted the three angelic hierarchies and set them in admirable order over the highest heaven, thou who hast most graciously proportioned the parts of the universe, Thou who art called the true font of light and wisdom, and the first beginning of all, begin to let the beam of thy splendor shine upon the darkness of my intellect, to dispel the twofold gloom of sin and ignorance in which I was born. My tongue to speak wise things, O thou who makest eloquent the tongues of babes, and do thou pour out upon my lips the grace of thy benediction. Give me keenness of comprehension, ability to retain, method and ease in acquiring, precision in interpreting, plenteous grace in speaking. Inspire my going in, guide my steps when I walk, and my going out do thou make perfect. Thou who art once God and man, and who reignest forever and ever. Amen. O blessed Thomas, patron of schools, obtain for us from God an invincible faith, burning charity, and a chaste life, and true knowledge through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Alphonsus de Liguori, pray for us. The Second Sunday of Advent John sent two of his disciples to Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Commentary for the Sunday Given by Dom Gaspar Lefebvre, Order of St. Benedict. Commentary for Sunday's Mass. The whole of today's liturgy is filled with the thought of Isaiah, whose name means the Lord saves, since he is beyond all others the prophet who proclaims the coming of Christ, the Redeemer. He foretold seven centuries before that a, quote, a virgin should conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel, end quote. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And that God should send his, quote, angel, that is, John the Baptist, should come to, quote, prepare the way before him, as the gospel for today says. And the Messiah should come clothed with the power of God himself to free all nations from the bondage of Satan. Quote, the ox, says Isaiah, meaning the Gentiles, knoweth not the owner, and the donkey his master's crib. But Israel hath not known me, and my people have not understood. End quote. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3. Quote, the root of Jesse, he goes on, shall rise up to rule the nations, as says today's epistle. And the deaf and the blind, plunged in darkness, that is, the heathen, shall hear the words of release and shall see, as the gospel says, then shall the true Jerusalem, that is, the church, quote, tremble with joy, as the communion verse for today's Mass says. For all the nations, sanctified by Christ, shall flow unto it, as says today's gradual. Quote, the Messiah, as Isaiah explains, will establish salvation from Zion and glory in Jerusalem. Zion shall be strong, for the Lord shall be its wall and its buckler, that is, its powerful protector. The station takes place at Rome in the Church of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, which was built by St. Helena to receive the relic of the Holy Cross. Every parish priest celebrates Mass for the people of his parish. The Andruit Taken from Psalm Chapter 30, verse 30. Commentary. Christ will be the deliverer and the shepherd of the faithful Jews and of the Gentiles. The Introit. People of Zion, behold the Lord shall come to save the nations, and the Lord shall make the glory of his voice to be heard in the joy of your heart. Give ear, O thou that rulest Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a sheep. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. People of Zion, behold, the Lord shall come to save the nations, and the Lord shall make the glory of his voice to be heard in the joy of your heart. The Collect Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the ways of of thine only begotten Son, that through his coming we may attain to serve thee with purified minds, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God world without end. Amen. Additional Collects for the Season During Advent The Collect of the Blessed Virgin Mary Quote, O God, who willed that thy word should take flesh at the message of an angel, in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, grant unto us, thy servants, that we who believe her to be truly the mother of God may be helped by her intercession with thee. Through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The third collect, against the persecutors of the church. Quote, we beseech thee, O Lord, mercifully to receive the prayers of thy church, that all adversity and error being destroyed, she may serve thee in security and freedom through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The Epistle, taken from the book of Romans, chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. Commentary. Isaiah had foretold, quote, There shall come forth a root out of the rod of Jesse, and a flower shall rise up out of his root, end quote. This root, 
St. Jerome explains, is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And, quote, by the flower we understood the Lord our Savior, end quote. Moreover, the epistle is taken from the passage where St. Paul, speaking of the same root of Jesse, exhorts all who are called to the same glory to be, quote, of one mind towards one another, according to Jesus Christ, end quote. The epistle. A lesson from the epistle of Blessed Paul the Apostle to the Romans. Brethren, what things whatsoever were written, were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. Now the God of patience and of comfort grant you to be of one mind, one towards another, according to Jesus Christ, that with one mind and with one mouth you may glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive one another as Christ also hath received you unto the honor of God. For I say that Christ Jesus was minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers that the Gentiles are to glorify God for his mercy, as it was written. Therefore will I confess to thee, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and will sing to thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and magnify him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah said, There shall be the root of Jesse, and he that shall rise up to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope and in the power of the Holy Ghost. The Gradual. Take him some Psalm 49, verses 2, 3, and 5. Commentary. The nations sanctified by Christ entered the church. The Gradual. Out of Zion, the loveliness of his beauty, God shall come manifestly. Gather ye together his saints to him, who have set his covenant before sacrifices. Alleluia, alleluia. I rejoiced at the things that were said to me. We shall go into the house of the Lord. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Matthew, chapter 11, verses 2 through 10. Commentary. The Gentiles will enter heaven together with the people of God. Isaiah foretold that the Messiah would be known by his miracles. And when John the Baptist himself, as the same prophet predicted, a messenger from Almighty God sent, quote, to prepare the way of the Messiah, end quote, caused our blessed Lord to be asked if he were indeed, quote, he who art to come, end quote. Christ proved his divine mission by the miracles worked by him, quote, but, St. Gregory explains, after so many wonders of the death of Jesus caused great scandal in the hearts of men faithless to God, and Christ himself foretold, us against this stumbling block to which the Jews fell victim, end quote. Let us therefore welcome our Lord in the lowliness of his manger, and when he will come, and then he will welcome us in his glory when he comes again to judge the world. The Gospel. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, sending two of his disciples, he said to him, Art thou he that art to come, or look we for another? And Jesus, making answer, said to them, Go, and relate to John what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead rise again, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he that shall not be scandalized in me. And when they went their way, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What went you out into the desert to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But that, but what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Behold, they are clothed in soft garments or in the house of kings. But what went you out to see? A prophet? Yea, I tell you, more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it was written, 
Behold, I send my angel before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. The Offertory, taken from Psalm 84, verses 7 and 8. Thou wilt turn, O God, and bring us to life, and thy people shall rejoice in thee. Show us, O Lord, thy mercy, and grant us thy salvation. The Secret Be appeased, we beseech thee, O Lord, by the prayers and offerings of our humility, and where we have no merits to plead for us, then do thou help us with thy aid. With thine aid, through, Jesus, through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, roll without end. Amen. The Secret for the Blessed Virgin Mary We beseech thee, O Lord, to strengthen in our hearts the mysteries of the fruit of faith, that we who confess him who was conceived of the Virgin may be true God and man, may by the power of his saving resurrection merit to attain eternal joy. Did the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, O Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The Secret Against the Persecutors of the Church Protect us, O Lord, who assist at thy mysteries, that fixed upon the divine we may serve thee in both body and mind, through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The Communion Antiphon Taken from the book of Baruch, chapter 5, verse 5, and chapter 4, verse 36. Commentary The cause of joy which God sends the true Jerusalem, the church, is the great concourse of the Gentiles, which brings within her walls. The Communion Antiphon Arise, O Jerusalem, and stand on high, and behold the joy that cometh to thee from thy God. The Post-Communion Verse Filled with the food of this spiritual nourishment, we supplantly entreat thee, O Lord, that through our participation in this mystery, thou wouldst teach us to despise earthly things and to love heavenly ones. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. Post-Communion for the Blessed Virgin Mary. For forth we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Post-Communion against the persecutors of the church. We beseech thee, O Lord, our God, that thou wouldest not suffer to be exposed to this human danger, those whom thou givest to rejoice in this divine banquet. Through Jesus Christ thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, roll without end. Amen. Sermon 2 For the Second Sunday of Advent On the Advantages of Tribulation Now when John had heard the wonderful works of Christ, etc. Matthew chapter 9, verse 2 In tribulations, God enriches his beloved souls with the greatest graces, Behold, St. John in his chains comes to the knowledge of the works of Jesus Christ. Quote, when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, end quote. Great indeed are the advantages of tribulation. The Lord sends them to us, not because he wishes our misfortune, but because he desires our welfare. Hence, when they come upon us, we will embrace them with thanksgiving, and must not only resign ourselves to the divine will, but must also rejoice that God treats us as he treated his Son, Jesus Christ, whose life upon the earth was always full of tribulation. I shall now show, in this first point, the advantages we derive from tribulations, and in the second, I shall point out the manner in which we ought to bear them. First point on the great advantages we derive from tribulations. Quote, what doth he know that had not been tried? A man that hath much experience shall think of many things, and he hath learned many things shall show forth understanding. End quote. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 34, verse 9. They who live in prosperity 
and have no experience of adversity, know nothing of the state of their souls. In the first place, tribulation opens the eyes which, which prosperity had shut. St. Paul remained blind after Jesus Christ appeared to him, and during his blindness he perceived the errors in which he lived. During his imprisonment in Babylon, King Manassas had recourse to God, was convinced the malice of his sins, and did penance for them. Quote, and after he was in distress, he prayed to the Lord his God, and did penance exceedingly for the, before the God of his fathers. End quote. Second Chronicles chapter thirty-three verse twelve. The prodigal, when he found himself under the necessity of feeding swine and afflicted with hunger, exclaimed, quote, I will arise and go to my father, End quote. Luke chapter 15, verse 18. Secondly, tribulation takes from our hearts all affection to earthly things. When a mother wishes to wean her infant, she puts gall on her paps to excite his disgust and to induce him to take better food. God treats us in a similar manner. To detach us from temporal goods, he mingles with gall, that by tasting its bitterness we may conceive of a dislike for them and place our affections on the things of heaven. Quote, God, says St. Augustine, mingles bitterness with earthly pleasures, that we may seek another felicity, whose sweetness does not deceive. End quote. Thirdly, they who live in prosperity are molested by many temptations of pride, of vainglory, of desires of acquiring greater wealth, greater honors, and greater pleasures. Tribulation frees us from these temptations and makes us humble and content in a state in which the Lord has placed us. Hence, the apostle says, quote, We are chastised by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with this world. End quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32. Fourthly, by tribulation we atone for the sins we have committed, much better than by voluntary works of penance. Quote, be assured, says St. Augustine, that God is a physician and that tribulation is a solitary medicine, end quote. Oh, how great is the efficacy of tribulation in the healing wounds caused by our sins. Hence, the same saint rebukes the sinner who complains to God for sending him tribulations. Quote, why, he says, do you complain? What shall you suffer? What you suffer is a remedy not a punishment, end quote. Job called those happy men whom God corrects by tribulation because he heals them with the very hands which he strikes and wounds them. Quote, Blessed is the man whom God correcteth, for he woundeth and cureth, he striketh and his hand shall heal, end quote. Job chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Hence, St. Paul glorified in his tribulations. Fifthly, by convincing us that God alone is able and willing to relieve us our miseries, tribulations remind us of him and compel us to have recourse to his mercy. Quote, in their affliction, they will rise early to me. End quote. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Hence, addressing the afflicted, the Lord said, quote, Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened and I will refresh you, end quote. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Hence, he is called, quote, a helper in troubles, end quote. Quote, when, says David, he slew them, they sought him, and they returned, end quote. Psalm chapter 77, verse 34. When the Jews were afflicted and were slain by their enemies, they remembered the Lord, and he returned to him. Sixthly, tribulations enable us to acquire great merits before God by giving us opportunities to exercise the virtues of humility, of patience, and resignation to the divine will. The venerable John de Avila used to say that a single blessed be God in adversity is worth more than a thousand acts in prosperity. Quote, Take away, says St. Ambrose, the contests of the martyrs, and you have taken away their crowns, end quote. Oh, what a treasure of merit is acquired by patiently bearing insults, poverty, and sickness. Insults of men were the great objects of the desires of the saints, 
who sought to be despised for the love of Jesus Christ and thus be made like unto him. How great is the merit gained by bearing with the inconveniences of poverty. Quote, O oh my God and my all, says St. Francis of Assisi, in expressing his sentiment, he enjoyed more a true riches than all the princes of the earth. Oh, how truly has St. Teresa of Avila said that, quote, the less we have here, the more we shall enjoy hereafter, end quote. Oh, how happy is the man who can say from his heart, my Jesus, thou alone art sufficient for me. If, says St. John Chrysostom, quote, you esteem yourselves unhappy because you are poor, you are indeed miserable and deserving of tears, not because you are poor, but because being poor, you do not embrace your poverty and esteem yourself happy, end quote. By bearing patiently with the pains of sickness, a great and perhaps the greater part of crown, which is prepared for us in heaven, is completed. The sick sometimes complain that in sickness they can do nothing, but they err, for in their infirmities they can do all things by accepting their sufferings with peace and resignation. Quote, the cross of Christ, Saint John, says St. John Chrysostom, is the key of paradise, end quote. St. Francis de Sales used to say, quote, To suffer constantly for Jesus is the science of the saints, and we shall soon become saints. End quote. It is by suffering that God proves his servants and finds them worthy of himself. Quote, Whom, says St. Paul, the Lord loveth, he chastiseth, and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. End quote. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. Hence, Jesus Christ once said to St. Teresa, quote, Be assured that the souls dearest to my Father are those who suffer the greatest afflictions. End quote. Hence, Job said, quote, If we have received good things at the hand of God, why should we not receive evil? End quote. Job chapter 2, verse 10. If we have gladly received from God the goods of this earth, we should not receive more cheerfully tribulations, which are far more useful to us than worldly prosperity. St. Gregory informs us that as a flame fanned by the wind increases, so a soul is made perfect when she experiences great tribulations. To holy souls, the most severe afflictions are the temptations by which the devil impels them to offend God. But they who bear these temptations with patience and banish them, turning to God, for help, shall acquire great merit. Quote, and, St. Paul says, God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will also make issue with the temptation that you may be able to bear it. End quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. God permits us to be molested by temptations, that by banishing them we may gain greater merit. Quote, Blessed, says the Lord, are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. End quote. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. They are blessed because, according to the apostle, our tribulations are momentary and very light compared with the greatness of the glory which shall be obtained for us for eternity in heaven. Quote, for that which is at present momentary and in light of our tribulation worketh for us above measure exceedingly an eternal weight of glory, end quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. It is necessary, then, says St. John Chrysostom, to bear tribulations in peace, quote, for if you accept them with resignation, you shall gain great merit, but if you submit to them with reluctance, you shall increase, instead of diminishing your misery, end quote. If we wish to be saved, we must submit to trials. Quote, Through many tribulations, we must enter into the kingdom of God. End quote. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. A great servant of God used to say that paradise is the place of the poor and of the persecuted, of the humble and the afflicted. Hence, St. Paul says, quote, Patience is necessary for you, that doing the will of God, you may receive the promise. End quote. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. God speaking of the tribulations of the saints. St. Cyprian asks, quote, What are they 
to the servants of God whom paradise invites, end quote. Is it much for those whom the eternal goods of heaven are promised to embrace short affliction in this life? In fine, the scourges of heaven are sent not for injury, but for our good. Quote, Let us believe that the scourges of the Lord with which, like servants, we are chastised, have happened for our amendment and not for our destruction. End quote. Judith chapter 8, verse 27. Quote, God, says St. Augustine, is angry when he does not scourge the sinner. End quote. When we see a sinner in tribulation in this life, we may infer that God wishes to have mercy on him in the next, and that he exchanges eternal for temporal chastisements. But miserable the sinner whom the Lord does not punish in this life. For those whom he does not chastise here, he treasures up his wrath and reserves the eternal chastisement. Quote, Why, asks the prophet Jeremiah, doth the wicked prosper? End quote. Why, Lord, do sinners prosper? To this the same prophet answers, quote, Gather them together as sheep for a sacrifice and prepare them for the day of slaughter. End quote. Tobias chapter 5 verse 3. As on the day of sacrifice the sheep intended for slaughter are gathered together, so the impious, as victims of divine wrath, are destined to eternal death. Quote, Destined them, says Duhamel in his commentary on this passage, as a victim of thy anger in the day of sacrifice. End quote. When, then, God sends us tribulation, let us say with Job, quote, I have sinned and indeed have offended, and I have not received what I have deserved, end quote. Job chapter 33, verse 27. O Lord, my sins merit a far greater chastisement than that which thou hast inflicted on me. We should even pray with St. Augustine, quote, Burn, cut, spare not in this life that thou mayest spare for us in eternity, end quote. How frightful is the chastisement of the sinner, of whom the Lord says, quote, Let us have pity on the wicked, but he will not learn justice. End quote. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 10. Let us abstain from chastising the impious. As long as they remain in this life, they will continue to live in sin and shall thus be punished with eternal torments. On this passage, St. Bernard says, Lord, I do not wish for such mercy which is a chastisement that surpasses all chastisements, end quote. The man whom the Lord afflicts in this life has a certain proof that he is dear to God, quote, and, said the angel to Tobias, because thou wast acceptable to God, it was necessary that temptation should prove thee, end quote. Tobias, chapter 12, verse 13. Hence, St. James pronounces, blessed is the man who is afflicted because after he shall have been proved by tribulation, he will receive the crown of life. End quote. James chapter 1, verse 12. He who wishes to share in the glory of the saints must suffer in this life as the saints have suffered. None of the saints have been esteemed or treated well by the world. All of them have been despised and persecuted. In them have been verified the words of the apostle, quote, All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, end quote. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Hence, St. Augustine says that they who are unwilling to suffer persecutions have not yet to begun to be called Christians. End quote. Quote, when we are in tribulation, let us be satisfied with the consolation of knowing that the Lord, when he is near to us, is in our company. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of contrite heart. End quote. Psalm chapter 33, verse 19. And, Quote, I am with him in tribulations, in quote, Psalm chapter 90, verse 15. The second point, on the manner in which we should bear tribulations. He who suffers tribulations in this world should, in the first place, abandon sin and endeavor to recover the grace of God. For as long as he remains in sin, the merit of all his sufferings is lost. Quote, if, says St. Paul, I should deliver my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing, in quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. If you have suffered all the torments of the martyrs, or bore to be burned alive, and were not in a state of grace, it would profit you nothing. But to those who can suffer with God, and with resignation for God's sake, 
All the tribulations shall be the source and comfort of gladness. Quote, your sorrow should be turned into joy. End quote. John chapter 16, verse 20. Hence, after having been insulted and beaten by the Jews, the apostles departed from the council full of joy because they had been maltreated for the love of Jesus Christ. All they indeed went from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were accounted worthy to suffer reproach for the name of Jesus. End quote. Acts chapter 5 verse 41. Hence, when God visits us with any tribulations, we must say with Jesus Christ, quote, The chalice which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? End quote. John chapter 18 verse 11. It is not necessary to know that every tribulation, though it may come from men, is sent to us by God. When we are surrounded on all sides with tribulation and know not what to do, we must turn to God, who alone can console us. Thus King Jehoshaphat, in distress, said to the Lord, quote, As we know not what to do, we can only turn our eyes to thee. End quote. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. Thus David also, in his tribulations, had recourse to God, and God consoled him. Quote, in my trouble I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. End quote. Psalm 119, verse 1. We should turn to God and pray to him, and never cease to pray till he hears us. Quote, As the eyes of the handmaid are upon the hands of her mistress, so are our eyes unto the Lord our God until he have mercy on us. End quote. Psalm chapter 122, verse 2. We must keep our eyes continually raised to God, and must continue to implore his aid until he is moved to compassion for our miseries. We must have great confidence in the heart of Jesus Christ and ought to imitate certain persons who instantly lose courage because they do not feel that they are heard as soon as they begin to pray. To them may be applied the words of the Savior to St. Peter, quote, O thou little of faith, why didst thou doubt? End quote. Matthew chapter 14, verse 31. When the favors which we ask are spiritual or can be profitable to our souls, we should be certain of being heard, provided we persevere in prayer and do not lose confidence. Quote, All things whatsoever you ask, when you pray, believe and you shall receive, and they shall come unto you. End quote. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. In tribulations, then, we should never cease to hope with confidence that the divine mercy will console us, and if and if our affliction we continue, we must say with Job, quote, Although he should kill me, I will trust in him. End quote. Job chapter 13, verse 15. Souls of little faith, instead of to turning to God in their tribulations, have recourse to human means, and thus provoke God's anger and remain in their miseries. Quote, Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord keep the city, he watcheth in vain that keepeth it. End quote. Psalm 126, verse 1. On this passage, St. Augustine writes, quote, All good, all help must come from the Lord. Without him, creatures can give us no assistance. End quote. Of this, the Lord complains by the mouth of his prophet, quote, Is not, he says, the Lord in Zion? Why then have you provoked me to wrath with their idols? Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is, the, is not the wound of the daughter of my people closed? End quote. Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 22. Am I not in Zion? Why then do men provoke me to anger by recurring to creatures which they convert into idols by placing them in all by placing all their hopes in them? Do they seek a ribbony for their miseries? Do they see do they not seek me in Gilead, a mountain full of balsamic ointments, which signify the divine misery, which signify the divine mercy? There they can find the physician and the remedy of all their evils. Why then, says the Lord, do your wounds remain open? Why are they not healed? Is it not because you have not recourse to me, but to creatures, and because you confide in them and not in me? In another place, the Lord says, quote, I am become a wilderness to Israel or a late ward springing land. Why then have my people said, We are revolted. We will come to thee no more. 
but my people have forgotten me days without number, end quote. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 31 and 32. God complains and says, Why, my children, do you say that we will have no recourse to men? God complains and says, quote, Why, my children, do you say that you have recourse to me no more? Am I become to you a barren land which gives no fruit or gives it too late? Is it for this reason that you have so long forgotten me? By the words he manifests to us his desire that we pray to him in order that we he may be able to give us his graces. And he also gives us to understand that when we pray to him, he is not slow, but instantly begins to assist us. The Lord, says David, is not asleep, that when we return that when we turn to his goodness and ask the graces which are profitable to our souls, he hears us immediately because he is anxious for our welfare. Quote, Behold, he shall neither slumber nor sleep that keepeth Israel. End quote. Psalm chapter 120, verse 4. When we pray for temporal favors, St. Bernard says that God, quote, will give us what we ask or something more useful, end quote. He will grant us the grace which we desire whenever it is profitable to our souls, or he will give us more useful grace, such as the grace to resign ourselves to the divine will and to suffer with patience our tribulations, which shall merit a great increase of glory in heaven. O oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee. Prayer to obtain final perseverance to Jesus and Mary. Eternal Father, I humbly adore and thank thee for having created me and for having redeemed me by the means of Jesus Christ. I thank thee for having made me a Christian by giving me the true faith and by adopting me for thy child in holy baptism. I thank thee for having given me the time for repentance after my many sins, and for having, as I hope, pardoned all my offenses against thee. O oh, infinite goodness, I thank thee also for having preserved me from falling again, as often as I should have done, if thou hadst not held me up and saved me. But my enemies do not cease to fight against me, nor will they until death, that they may again have me for their slave. If thou dost not keep and help me continually by thy assistance, I shall be wretched enough to lose thy grace anew. I therefore pray thee, for the love of Jesus Christ, to grant me holy perseverance till death. Thy Son, Jesus, has promised that thou wilt grant us whatever we ask in his name. By the merits, then, of Jesus Christ, I beg thee for myself and for all those who are in thy grace, the grace of never more being separated from thy love, but that we may always love thee in this life and in the next. Mary, Mother of God, pray to Jesus for me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.